Okay, well, thank you very much for watching this tutorial. This is uh, one of the informed tutorials for uh, the meeting 2021. Uh, my name is Jose Blanchet, and I'm joined here uh, by Kartik. Uh, together, we're going to give, uh, we're going to deliver this tutorial. Viet wasn't able to make it. Um, uh, so we are going to just split the tutorial between both of us. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, the statistics of uh, Wasserstein uh, distributionally robust optimization um, estimators. And um, um, and uh, we are going to first start with um, what is uh, empirical uh, risk uh, minimization. So this is um, a class of uh, uh, stochastic optimization problems that are data driven. And the objective is to select a policy just based on data. So this uh, L function represents a, a certain um, a loss function. It could be a quadratic loss if we are fitting a linear regression model. Um, it could be just uh, uh, the logistic loss if uh, in the context of logistic regression or could be um, a model in which we want to minimize cost um, and the XIs are um, the, the observations collected uh, for some uh, minimization probe, right? So this uh, represents, uh, for example, for each of the observations collected, the, the losses, uh, the take this uh, nice ide idealized sort of convex uh, shape for every realization of, for example, the demand parameter or the predictor. Um, and you want to enterize it could be a, um, a policy, um, a, a parameter that represents a policy. All right. Um, so what happens is in, in a typical application of uh, stochastic optimization, data-driven stochastic optimization in the form of empirical risk minimization, you collect your data. Uh, the data is, of course, uh, uh, obtained and represents um, an idealization or a, or a description of what we are going to face uh, in the future, right? When we actually prescribe the policy. And the, um, and the reality is that um, you know the the future what we are going to see is not going to be exactly similar to what we saw in the past. It might be slightly different. And the and the idea is that um, you know if we had a mechanism to actually perturb the data a little bit, um, all of these perturbations, right, um, subject to a constraint that the size of the perturbations, the sum of all the size of the perturbations, um, is less than some budget. Well, this could be a formalism that could allow us to, um, you know, recognize that uh, that um, out of sample uh, realizations are exactly what we are going to face uh, when we prescribe the policy. So this uh, mechanism um, that allows for out of out of sample exploration will be a very um, intuitive and uh, and powerful way of. Uh, formulating um, a stochastic optimization uh, that is data driven. Okay. Now, how by how much uh, uh, these perturbations should be uh, uh, allowed to to um, be displaced, right, or to be applied? Uh, this is a very important question, of course. If uh, we we explore the world of sample explorations with a huge uh, you know, possibilities of perturbations. Well, at that point, maybe that has nothing to do really with reality, with the reality that has been observed. So this balance between uh, exploring um, what is a reasonable amount is quite important. And the point of this talk is precisely um, uh, provide um, uh, a, a rigorous, solid, and um, a foundational way of actually choosing this size of these perturbations. That's the point, right? Um, all right. Um, so what we, what I have described here in pictures, so this idea of um, taking this stochastic optimization problem and explore simultaneously the possibilities that, you know, the data is slightly different from what has been observed, can actually be captured precisely in a formulation that is known as Wasserstein distributionally robust optimization. So what we do is we incorporate 
um, this um, game, right? So you want to make or the the um, optimizers wants to choose a policy is the same. But now what we want to do is we want to maximize um, all possible um, averages that we can take. And uh, this uh, object here uh, represents, is going to represent precisely, um, uh, is going to uh, uh, represent the, the points xi primes, right, xi primes. Um, uh, x primes. Uh, and you have original points x size, right? They will become x primes. And what you what you want to have is that the sum, for example, of some cost of transporting x i to x i prime, right? Uh, the average cost is less than delta. So this is what this is going to represent in the end, right? So you are going to move this, and basically what what we are doing is is in a way choosing the x i primes choosing worst case, case xi primes, okay? So that's that's uh, the formulation that will capture precisely this. And that's in the end what Wasserstein DRO does, okay? But we do it in a relaxation that turns out to be very similar to this. So this is the intuition. And, but this is basically this for all practical purposes, exactly this, all right. On one hand, we have this uh, formulation. Now, on the other hand, there is this object here that we haven't uh, um, talked about. And I'm going to discuss this object in the context of a statistical inference, and in fact, uh, hypothesis testing. So what is this object? Well, what I'm doing here is I'm computing the smallest distance. So that you, you should think of this as a distance, right? So it's called the Wasserstein distance. And I'm going to define it um, precisely. OK. Um, and then, uh, so what, what we're computing is, well, what's the smallest distance between Pn, which is the data? So this Pn is equal to data, gen uh, empirical, uh, empirical distribution on the, on the space of data, empirical. Right, uh, distribution on data. Uh, and then you are minimizing over all a uh, piece that satisfies some property. So this is some manifold, some set of uh, probability models. So it's the closest probability model to the data. Right? So it turns out that this uh, projection, so this is basically you are projecting to this set F theta, we call this the hypothesis class. Uh, turns out to be very, very related to this, uh, 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 to the choice of this object delta. So this is going to be um, at the core of what we are going to press, uh, talk about in this tutorial. So choosing this delta will have to do with this, um, this optimization problem, this projection. Okay. So this, uh, um, this actually is a problem that uh, that is seen also quite frequently in the literature and artificial intelligence, more or less these forms of problems, right? Uh, so for example, in the context of the Wasserstein generative adversarial networks, uh, Wasserstein GANs, they precisely one minimizes over all, para all probability measures in a set um, to fit uh, the data the best possible way. So this, is, this has connections to this um, type of uh, problems as well. So the, the, the rest of the talk is about connecting these two um, on one hand, distributional robust optimization, on the other hand, these projections with the goal of actually informing this guy here. All right. Um, so what is it that we're going to gain by uh, establishing this connection? Well, uh, we are going to talk about, we're going to see that by doing this, we are going to uh, beat the curse of dimensionality. So one approach for choosing um, this uh, delta, if you take a look at the left-hand side, well, you can choose delta such that um, um, D, C between the true distribution, this is the true distribution, and the data um, is less or equal to delta, but this uh, implies a delta that is big, delta too big. So it's overly conservative. So we don't want that, and instead we're going to 
uh, use this other approach, and this allows us to uh, reduce the, the, the curse of dimensionality. So we are going to see that we are going to recover um, a high dimensional statistics. So when, when the left-hand side here um, turns out to uh, recover objects that have been studied uh, quite extensively in the high dimensional statistics uh, literature, turns out that this selection that we're going to discuss based on the, on the right-hand side uh, for choosing Delta actually coincides exactly with, that, uh, with those um, choices. So in that sense, it's going to be optimal. This, uh, uh, the choice of Delta turns out to solve an, uh, uh, an uh, optim um, a stochastic optimization problem. In fact, a chance constraint optimization problem. So this is in which, in, in that sense, optimal uh, Delta. Uh, solves um, an optimization problem. And we are going to see that the right-hand side also is related to, um, because it's related to uh, statistical inference and hypothesis testing, a nice application that has been used recently is uh, testing fairness of algorithms, okay? So according to multiple uh, criteria. So we have a lot to cover. Uh, I'm going to uh, go fast. Uh, right, so I'm actually <laughs> falling behind now already. I need to catch up. Um, and uh, so all of this is going to be in the menu. Uh, the rest of the talk is split in two parts. First, I'm going to give you these connections to, um, I'm going to talk uh, very, very briefly about the advantages of Wasserstein DRO, although um, it's going to be very brief and very fast because I don't want to repeat what Dan Kuhn and, and the co authors have covered in the previous tutori tutorial from 2019. Um, and then I'm going to talk about uh, the problem of uh, defining this projection in the context of, uh, of a statistical inference for hypothesis testing. And then I'm going to um, uh, pass the baton to Kartek so that he can connect back to choosing the size of uncertainty, okay? All right, so uh, we are gonna move on. We already talked about this. So I'm gonna talk about um, the Wasserstein DRO formulation. So. Uh, in the end, we want to uh, find the decision, right, corresponding to um, uh, minimizing the expected loss under a probability model P star, which we know is the true data generating model, which is unknown. Okay, so we are after this guy here, but because P star is unknown, theta star is going to be unknown. Okay. So the procedure is, as we say, well, we connect the data, we collect the data. Uh, and we form uh, the empirical uh, distribution on the data, right? So this is the distribution that is obtained um, by just sampling the observed data uniformly. Uh, and then we uh, postulate this um, uh, dist uh, distributionally robust optimization um, uh, problem. Now, uh, as I said, I already have given a description, intuitive description of what is here. Um, I'm going to give a more precise description. So it turns out that this, this is the definition of this, uh, this DC object. So let me expand what this is. So this is minimizing the cost of transporting. Actually, I'm going to do it here. So this is minimizing, minimizes the cost of transporting mass from X to X prime. So what's the, you transpose mass from point X to X, X prime. Uh, point x prime this is the cost of transportation so unit of mass uh, cost transporting per unit of mass okay so what's the unit of mass here is the unit of mass i'm assuming everything is continuous and then you have this integration so that's the cost of transporting everything subject to the constraint that uh, you are transporting uh, a piece of uh, uh, sand here, right? That, that, that is denoted by the uh, brown mass. So that is model using PX. And then you are transporting um, to some target shape uh, that is going to model according to this castle, right? So the shape of the castle, so that's the Q. And so this is an LP, and that's what 
that's what this TCPQ is, right? It's just simply a linear programming problem where you are uh, minimizing, you are computing the cheapest way of transporting mass uh, from this uh, pile of sand to the castle. Okay, so this uh, problem is called the Cantorov visualization to the to to um the um to the Munch original problem. The version in which I uh, pick points um, directly points x prime, right? Uh, like matching, that's the Munch version. And it turns out that this uh, relaxation of the matching problem uh, turns out to be uh, actually exact in many cases. Um, so what we really have in mind in the DRO version is kind of is the Munch version where you are matching point, points x i to points x i prime uh, according to the arrows that I mentioned earlier. So anyway, so this um, this is the the precise formulation. This is exactly the, uh, the one that we use, uh, and that's the Wasserstein distance. Turns out, as Dan is co uh, and and co-authors cover in that tutorial, um, this is a way to account for model errors in a non-parametric way. So that's what honest means, right? So it's non-parametric. It includes basically all distributions that satisfy some um, some um, moment constraints. Um, you as as any DRO formulation that is non-parametric, this one, uh, this one is one in particular that under promises and over delivers because you your benchmark is the worst case distribution in in a certain ball. So of course, relative to that, you are going to do well. Uh, and the idea is to not um, choose a very adversarial distribution. So really select a delta that is uh, useful. Otherwise, the perturbations are too big, and this is not a useful in practice. So this is uh, really provided um, to be useful um, so that we, um, th this as, uh, minimizes the disappointment, but what we want is to um, uh, choose <clears throat> is well chosen, right? Otherwise not very helpful. So yes, you are not gonna be disappointed, but because you really expect really, really bad performance. We don't want that, right? So we want something that actually is reasonable. Um, so it turns out to be tractable uh, in many cases uh, because of this linear programming connection. Um, we are going to co uh, cover in this tutorial uh, performance guarantees out of sample performance statistical uh, guarantees. Um, uh, we are going to see that these uh, formulations actually recover exactly uh, well-known estimators such as the lasso estimator, group regularization, uh, etc. So all of these are um, a particular case of what we are covering now uh, with this Vassar Standard So that's kind of like really cool. And this is really important because um, many of these, uh, 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 in, the, in those particular cases where we can recover the uh, estimators that are um, well known in the statistics, like high dimensional estimators, then we can do a comparison, right? Um, between the way in which we are going to be choosing the size of uncertainty uh, using uh, this criterion, the hypothesis testing criterion, um, versus the high dimensional statistical criterion, we're going to make a comparison, turns out to be uh, to be a, basically the same, exactly the same, the same guarantees, the same recovery. So um, this is going to be like a sanity check, and that's why it's useful that we recover all of these cases. And something that is nice about uh, the Wasserstein DRO estimators is that you, because you are exploring out of sample scenarios, you actually anticipate scenarios that you haven't seen never in the past. So that's uh, also um, kind of cool. And this is why the community has embraced these types of estimators. We take the point of view, okay, these estimators have been embraced because of all of these intuitive properties. Um, there is the 2019 tutorial that tells you how to um, uh, uh, reformulate these uh, min-max games in many cases so that you can use um, a, a software, uh, uh, optimization software. And so this tutorial is mostly about the use of these formulations in a statistical hypothesis test, for example, fairness, and most importantly, and this is the key message of this um, talk, how to choose the size of um, the uncertainty uh, set in Wasserstein DRO in a way that is optimal, statistically speaking, uh, that avoids the curse of dimensionality and that recovers the high dimensional statistics uh, guarantees in the cases where uh, they coincide um, with those estimators. All right. 
So very briefly, why these estimators uh, end up being tractable? Uh, and the reason is because uh, this, this part, which is the infinite dimensional optimization problem, is just a big linear programming problem. So you see this expected value is linear in P, right? So this is the integral of L of X theta PX DX. You see it's linear in P. So this is just a big optimization problem. This region, um, as we saw, is also described by a linear constraint. So linear optimization, linear constraints. And therefore, you know, there is a formal dual, which is, um, which, um, is, um, is an LP as well. And it can be simplified to take uh, this form here, okay? So as a function of lambda, uh, this, uh, this uh, function inside is the maximum here of linear functions in lambda. So that's convex plus affine plus linear. That's the whole thing is convex in lambda. And if, um, and if this inner optimization problem is tractable, right, as a function of Z here, uh, then you will have a closed form expression that you can optimize. The whole optimization problem in that case will be a nice convex optimization problem, right? So this is, if the L was convex in theta, this is going to be maximum of convex functions convex. And so you are minimizing overall um, a sort of nice convex function. So this is why this has been um, popular because in many cases of interest, the inner optimization can actually be computed in closed form. And uh, when not, there, is, there are also algorithms that can be used uh, to solve this optimization problem efficiently that are described in the tutorial. Uh, in the tutorial paper companion to these slides. All right. So this is one example, right? Uh, this example is interesting uh, because in fact, uh, this function here, this covariance, right? Uh, is not a linear function of, uh, of, of P, right? So that's expected value of P of uh, X minus expected value of X uh, times um, X transpose minus expected value of P uh, X transpose. So you see this, this thing has, a, has the expectation here um, twice. So it's, this is really um, a quadratic um, function of, um, it's like the variance, right? Variance is, that variance is not a linear function of P. And so despite this not being um, a linear function of P, you still can, solve this, uh, uh, you, you apply this duality using an additional optimization trick and you can uh, solve this problem. So this is worked out in the tutorial. So this is um, just, so what I'm trying to say is that uh, even though this duality I described in the linear case, this problem can still be done. And so that's a nice example that you can see in the tutorial. Okay, another nice thing that you can see in this example uh, observation is that you see in this case, the way in which we measure the cost function is using a, a norm. You see the LQ norm square. So that means that we are using the Wasserstein distance of what is called uh, order two. So Wasserstein order two, uh, two, this is the two. Uh, you have LQ and you have this duality. So this is your cost function. And you see what appears here is actually regularization of the decision parameter theta, right? Um, with the dual norm LP, okay? And you see this uh, regularization parameter here? Well, that's exactly the size of uncertainty. So this is the connection in the context of like high dimensional statistical estimators where you see these parameters and the literature that studies how these estimators need to be chosen. Well, this is where we can compare whether the criterion that we're going to discuss here corresponds to that criterion in high dimensional statistics? And the answer is yes, right? They both correspond by doing this hypothesis testing projection version that I'm gonna talk about later in, the, in this talk. Um, the other application is linear regression. So this is precisely the square root lasso estimator. Okay. Uh, by Alex Belloni. Um, so it recovers that uh, estimator. And uh, once again, what you can see is that um, you have duality, uh, you have the distance at Q in the predictors X. We put an infinite distance because we want uh, exact recovery, right? 
So exact recovery means that, uh, you know, basically there is no uncertainty in the output, the response, all the distributional uncertainty comes in the, in the predictor uh, parameter and you have this duality between uh, you know, LP and LQ. And, um, and so it's very, very similar in this case, all right? So these are two examples. You can look at uh, those in the paper. As I say, there are um, other examples where you, can, uh, you cannot compute the, the inner optimization problem. In all of these cases, what the reason we can get these uh, forms is that the inner optimization, namely this thing, can be computed in closed form. Right. Uh, but there are cases you, can, you cannot do it, and still you can solve the optimization problem um, explicitly. Uh, not sorry explicitly, but with an algorithm that is that is very fast, and um, that's uh, in uh, optimal transport uh, and uh, for um, and iterative schemes, uh, schemes uh, by a paper. that is going to appear in uh, Math of War. Okay, uh, so this is for uh, general DRO with affine decision rules. Okay, so um, what we want to do now, okay, so we have described why it's intuitive to solve these problems. We have seen that this guy here connects to regularization in many cases. And it's very important to set it up correctly. And now what we're going to do is we're going to explore how to do this uh, from the standpoint of uh, this optimization problem. Uh, so for the moment, what I'm going to do is uh, I'm going to um, talk about the statistical inference. I'm going to come back to the choice of regularization parameter later, but, uh, but I'm going to turn to um, these types of problems from the standpoint uh, of their applications and the interpretation of uh, statistical inference, and in particular, hypothesis testing. So I'm going to concentrate on hypothesis testing. Okay, so let me switch gears for the moment. I'm gonna talk about uh, testing this hypothesis that theta zero satisfies um, this equation. Um, and the, this is this this type of hypothesis uh, appears uh, often in applications, right? So um, this this could be like the mean, and h of x could be of the form, for example, uh, x minus theta zero. So you are testing if x uh, if uh, the mean of x is equal to theta zero. This could be a multidimensional vector, and you have different. You might have different sizes. It's it's really um, convenient this type of formulation. So you want to test if, um, um, uh, for example, the mean is equal to theta zero. Uh, so the way in which you can do that, um, you can formulate this problem uh, in the following way. So uh, we can define the um, hypothesis class of f of theta. So these are the uh, distributions models that satisfy that um, a expected value of h of x of theta for a fixed theta is equal to zero. So f of theta zero is the class of distributions that make this expectation zero, right? But for, for any probability p. And now the question is, so that the hypothesis that, say, that says that uh, theta zero um, satisfies uh, this expectation um, equal to zero, uh, is the same as saying that the, the the distribution, in particular p star, which is the true distribution that generates the data, uh, is inside this hypothesis class versus is not. Okay, so this one way of testing this hypothesis is testing if p star is inside the hypothesis class versus the alternative. Okay, now of course, if p star is in the hypothesis class, um, then the distance between the hypothesis class uh, to P star is equal to zero because P star is a member there. So you can just choose P equal to P star and the distance is equal to zero. Uh, so, so you would expect that uh, you want to reject the null hypothesis if the evidence suggests that this quantity is not equal to zero, right? So in other words, what you can do is you can look at the data, right? 
So you look at this data, this projection. This again is going to be a, a linear programming problem, right? So you can compute this. Uh, there is a, we're going to talk about that in an algorithm later, but uh, in a way, so this is a statistics that, that you can see that it depends only on the data and you want to reject the hypothesis if this value of the statistics, which is a proxy for, for actual, um, for the distance, which under the null hypothesis should be zero, you reject the, the statistic for large values of, the, of, uh, of itself, right? So you reject the hypothesis, you don't reject the statistics, sorry, you reject the hypothesis for large values of this statistic, this test statistic, okay? Um, because you would expect this to be uh, equal to zero. Okay, so um, of course um, we know that uh, this this statistic we're gonna call p for projection. So you are projecting uh, p n uh, given this parameter theta. So that's uh, this is the the, the meaning of using this minimum. And um, and uh, what happens is that uh, as the data sample size increases. Under the null hypothesis, this projection is going to converge to zero, and uh, it turns out that uh, the rate of convergence, convergence if the transportation distance is uh, this cost is uh, the LQ distance square. Um, once again, this rate of convergence, the this quantity, the projection converges to zero under the null hypothesis at rate of order one over n, and um, and this can be just shown using uh, duality theory as we do it. Uh, in this paper here. Uh, so you can go and take a look at the paper. And uh, the idea is that um, not only a, the you can compute the rate, but you can compute the T statistic, uh, the test statistic. So um, in the case, for example, where the uh, expectation P is for the P is equal to two. So in the case of uh, a quadratic um, uh, norm, the L2 norm, uh, this just becomes a quadratic form, and uh, and so so for p equal to two, then psi is quadratic, and uh, so therefore psi star will also be quadratic. Okay, um, I'm not going to do the you know we're going to come back later. There will be a slide where we compute exactly what are these um, distributions. I just want you know basically. Uh, concentrate on the high level picture of how this hypothesis testing uh, would work. So the way it would work is now this depends on the data. You could compute, you can compute this projection um, using a linear programming problem, right? Or um, uh, you are going to um, uh, compute this number and now you compare this number to, um, so you compare P, Pn theta zero uh, against n the quantile, and this is the quantile of this distribution. So this is the one minus alpha quantile of this uh, quadratic form um, divided by n. So if this quantity, if this is larger than this value, then um, you reject the null hypothesis with one minus alpha confidence. So this is, so this is uh, the, um, uh, the the dictated by the um, so alpha is the confidence level. Okay. Um, so the the one natural question you. Uh, 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 my consider this covariance is covariance of course on the on their p star uh, this expectation is expectation on their p star and uh, because you do not know p star which is the data generating distribution all what you can do is just replace everything by the plug-in estimators uh, based on the empirical sample so um, you simply you know replace this uh, you can use Instead of p star, you simply use the empirical version and still works. So use empirical version of parameters. And still the, the theorem is valid. 
So again, this is very fast. Later in the presentation, we actually do an example, an algorithm and an example that is um, uh, more uh, in, you know, uh, um, in detail. Uh, I, this is just a simple application of this, um, of this, of this uh, setting. So this is the context of uh, testing fairness. There is a uh, multiple criteria that can be used for uh, testing fairness. Uh, you can look at this paper uh, for the, for, for example, this criteria is called, is called the um, equalized odds uh, criterion. Uh, so basically you want to classify the probability that a classifier uh, 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 gives you a label, right? Um, given the attributes uh, and uh, given the, the, uh, the, 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 sorry, the fairness, given the attributes and the, and the label um, shouldn't be, shouldn't, should not really depend on the, on the attributes, right? So whatever is the attributes, you basically want to have um, the value of this independent of this of these attributes and this is uh, what you know this is one criterion you can have multiple criteria and uh, in this case the hypothesis class turns out is um, is not linear right uh, because the, because of this uh, ratio this conditional probabilities involve ratios but still this idea of uh, of uh, projecting can be applied and this is carried out in this paper um, in uh, fact in ICML where uh, we actually do this uh, compute these uh, statistics and we um, use them to um, classify algorithms right in terms of multiple uh, testing fairness criteria so the the idea of this of this application showing it this quickly is not to cover the details but actually show that this projection um, tool um, is convenient and has been used uh, in, in settings that are uh, related to fairness and related to hypotheses that are not linear in the function um, in, the, in the probability distribution like this one, right? So this one involves in particular, for example, a ratio and uh, some other nonlinear hypothesis classes. So um, I think it's better to just refer to this uh, references so that you can take a look. Um, so in this case, the, the test turns out to be just the um, a linear combination of uh, independent high square. So it's a generalized high square. Um, so I think uh, I'm going to hand off, uh, over this now to Kartik. Kartik. Uh, so Kartik is going to talk about, uh, she's going to move from the hypothesis testing examples to uh, computing the distance in in this Wasserstein DRO formulation. So we are so I this I, I talk about the Wasserstein DRO problems, the hypothesis testing, and now he's talking he's going to talk about how to use the hypothesis testing interpretation to pick the vast, the size of uncertainty. Thanks very much, Jose. I will now enter the next part of the tutorial, namely selecting the Wasserstein ball radius in DRO optimally via the projections just Jose introduced. Just to summarize, with optimal transport as the starting point, Jose has utilized the first half, introducing two tools, namely one, distributionally robust optimization, abbreviated as DRO, and two, optimal transport projections. In DRO, we minimize the worst case loss within a Wasserstein ball to choose a decision which performs well even against the least favorable distribution within the ball. Where is an optimal transport projections, we find the most favorable distribution within the manifold of distributions, satisfying the given hypothesis. The two, the two are seemingly unconnected. Since the former is for use in data-driven optimization, where is the later is for use in inferential tasks such as hypothesis testing, as was I just discussed. Now, we shall see how the concept of projections can be used to optimally inform the radius of the ball and how this is useful in combating the conservativeness of DRO. A common recommended approach in the literature for choosing the radius delta of the Wasserstein ball is to choose delta large enough so that the true data generating 
process or the distribution belongs to an ambiguity set with some belongs to a ball with some uh, pre-specific con confidence. This approach, however, leads to a pessimistic selection of delta simply because this criterion is not informed at all by the laws defining the decision of the problem. Indeed, the dimensional dependence in the concentration inequalities used for this purpose is such that we will require an exponential amount in D, uh, more samples, like uh, the, where D is the dimension of X. We will require exponential amount in D, more samples, to half the error in the resulting DRO solution. The most popular approach used in practice is, however, based on cross-validation. Despite its popularity, cross-validation is often used in a way which could lead to inconsistent estimation. That is, we mean incorrect identification of the optimal decision. For example, hold, hold out and leave one out cross-validation does not guarantee consistency in multivariate regression estimation. The k-fold cross-validation approach leads to consistent estimation, but it requires that k grows at the same rate as n, and n minus k converges to, uh, kind of like, or also is separated as well. As a consequence, when applying k-fold k cross-validation, one needs to solve k-optimization problems where k could be large. Typically, but in practice, k is chosen as a small number, such as k is equal to 5. But given the cautionary results in Jun Shao's uh, JASA paper in 1993, it is unclear if these choices are always appropriate relative to a given sample size n. We next move to our projection-based approach. A key conceptual ingredient in this approach is the collection of all decisions we denote by lambda delta, which are optimal for some distribution within the Wasserstein ball. We can call this collection of optimal decisions as compatible with the distributional uncertainty set because when we consider a probability distribution P within the ball as a plausible variation of the data, then any decision which is optimal for that plausible variation P should serve as a plausible variation of the optimal decision as well. In that sense, every distributional uncertainty set induces a compatible decision uncertainty set. And this decision uncertainty set, lambda delta, should naturally become bigger when we use a Wasserstein ball with larger delta. Then the question becomes, what is the smallest radius delta such that the true optimal solution, which we are after, lies within the decision uncertainty set lambda delta? Pictorially, this means when we draw the Wasserstein ball, it should be large enough to include at least one distribution for which theta star is optimal. To see this, recall that theta star is the true optimum from the data generating distribution P star. Under convexity and differentiability, this means the solution theta star can be written as solving a first order condition, which is this, just the derivative of the expected loss set to zero. Constraint cases can be handled similarly as well, but we consider just the unconstrained case for simplicity here. Then our question becomes, is the empirical distribution Pn generated from a distribution in this manifold of distributions satisfying the optimality condition at theta star? This is basically the hypothesis testing problem that Jose introduced earlier. And you may remember that the projection metric turned out to be a critical statistic in performing the test. We can see that the projection is critical in selecting delta as per this question because we can see from the figure that a true optimum theta star belongs to the compatible uncertainty set, lambda delta, if and only if the projection belongs to the Wasserstein ball. If the radius is smaller than the projection distance, as shown in the dark blue circle, then the corresponding decision set will not include the true optimum theta star. Various, if the radius is large enough to intersect with the optimality manifold, then we will have the optimal theta star lying in the compatible decision set lambda delta. All of this means that the radius should be at least as much as the projection metric calligraphic P evaluated at the empirical distribution Pn. Though we do not know what exactly is the projection metric, since we do not know the true optimum theta star, we come armed with a limiting result that Jose introduced in hypo hypothesis testing. So if you recall, under the null hypothesis that theta star is optimal for data generating P star, we have n times the projection metric converges to a nice limiting distribution as shown here. Then the question of choosing delta large enough to satisfy our criterion with, the, with probability one minus alpha is just to choose delta as the one minus quant alpha quantile of the left-hand side. 
which is n times the projection metric due to the con due to this convergence in distribution this is the same as choosing the delta larger than 1 minus alpha quantile of the right hand side limit scale down of course by a factor of n because of the scaling of n here so the prescription from the optimal transport projection analysis that we just did turns out to be delta equal to eta 1 over alpha divided by n where eta 1 over alpha 1 minus alpha is the 1 minus alpha quantile of the limiting cds so i i repeat the quantities involved in the limit for the sake of completeness here and 1 minus alpha quantile of the limit can be derived from the cds like uh, in the same manner as we use z tables or t tables to show an example let us lo look at a, a linear regression case where the first order optimality condition obtained from the derivative of the square loss is just simply expected value of y minus theta star transpose x x equals 0 here uh, this the quantity inside the expectation serves as the function h the, uh, the estimating criterion h now this h is what feeds into the limit here and all we need to compute is phi of psi theta which is actually like for the linear regression example computer computable in close form but let me for simplicity let me just show the limit for the example with unit error variance and identity covariance for x here the function involved in the limit is quadratic as shown here and the limit is consequently a chi square random variable with d degrees of freedom up to a scaling constant the 1 minus alpha quantile of the limit of for chi square random variable scales logarithmic in d over alpha where d is the dimensions of x while this is a simplified example the same phenomena holds in much greater generality and our choice of radius grows as you see here only logarithmic in the dimensions we can contrast this with the case of exponential dimension dependence on d when we go with the earlier case of use of concentration bounds indeed with the concentration bounds we are trying to find a large enough ball like the red ball shown here which covers the true distribution p star the scales of the two radius are not even comparable and it gets only worse as we increase the dimensions if we wish to be precise in quantifying the constants involved in the choice of the radius we work this out in the square root lasso example that we discussed earlier it is worthwhile to recall the robust linear regression example jose showed where washington dro just reduces to norm regularization with the regularization parameter square uh, equal to square root of the radius delta interestingly what we find is that our this prescription of delta based on optimal transport projections coincides with the regularization base threshold that has been established as necessary for signal recovery independently entirely independently long back in high dimensional statistics thus this result helps us to see that the parallels go beyond simple equivalence in regularization and points to much deeper structure and what it would take to arrive at robust it not overly conservative decisions in a wider range of higher dimensional problems where mere regularization may not be efficacious we show the steps summarizing all the elements involved in the selection of delta here as you as you may see the only task really involved is like to find the quantile eta 1 minus alpha of the limiting distribution phi star for this one can use plug in estimates from data wherever needed for example since the limit involves the covariance of the estimation of the estimation criterion h we we can just estimate it by plugging in a any consistent estimator for covariance matrix from the data that's what we show here in step 1 and in examples where we don't have a closed form expression for the quantile we can actually use simulation to estimate the quantile as shown in the step 2 here then the dro solution is just obtained by letting delta equal to the estimated quantile divided by n and that's actually like the next we discuss like has desirable very desirable statistical properties so having discussed the projection based approach towards selecting delta we move to the last part of the tutorial discussing both the large sample and finite sample statistical properties if we wish to go beyond simple examples involving norm regularization and try to develop a deeper conceptual understanding of the washington dro in action 
then the following result is quite helpful. Here we find that the DRO objective, that is basically the worst case loss evaluated within the washer chain fault, admits an expansion in the radius, which is accurate as the radius delta is decreased to zero. The first term, let me explain the expansion now. The first term in the expansion is merely the empirical risk. The effect of DRO becomes evident in the second term, whose effect shrinks at the rate square root of the radius. This term involves a regularization term, V theta, which actually can be seen as the L2 norm of the derivative of the loss. It is important to note that the derivative is with respect to the variable X, which measures the sensitivity in loss to the perturbations in data space. Thus, the term V theta can be seen as capturing the expected sensitivity with respect to variations in data. And when we see together the expansion, we can interpret DRO as striving to choose solutions theta, which have lower sensitivities. This can be understood well if we, if, for example, if we have several good solutions, which is often the case with uh, classically underdetermined uh, underdetermined problems or over parameterized models. But this is also the, often the case in modern machine learning settings where many models can be seen as explaining the data equally well, a phenomenon dubbed by uh, Leo Braven as Rashomon effect. DRO formulations of this type try to mitigate this difficulty to some extent by choosing among the infinitely many solutions which are among the several or infinitely many solutions which are available, they tend to favor the solutions with lower variations to data perturbations, which measured here the variations to data perturbation is, uh, is, uh, is kind of measured by this V theta term, capturing the magnitude of the perturbation, the expected magnitude of the perturbations. So the DRO formulation prefers to choose solutions which are more robust or less sensitive to perturbations among all models that appear to explain the data equally well. So we call this V theta term as sensitivity driven regularization or uh, model uh, or like variation regularization. But one can see that actually like in contrast to a plain norm regularization, here the regularization term is actually induced by the combination of both the loss and the distribution. So one can see this as a model driven regularization. So regularization of this flavor has proved out to be quite useful in adversarial training in machine learning. Now to kind of explain this phenomena, the robustness to perturbations in data space uh, with an example, consider this experiment, simple experiment involving linear regression in two dimensions with 100 different independently sampled data sets. The left panels here correspond to, to the underdetermined case due to the near collinearity or high positive correlations seen here, rho is equal to 0 0.95. The right hand, the, uh, the, the other case, which is the right hand panel, have no such collinearity issues. And we consider two different, of, uh, two different choices of theta star. Without DRO, we see that the black dots, which are just the empirical risk minimizing solutions, tend to be quite dispersed in the near collinear, uh, near collinear case and can result in starkly different it's quite dispersed and it can result in starkly different solutions in each run. The DRO estimators denoted as red circles, on the other hand, tend to cluster, get clustered around the true optimal theta with a slight bias or slight pull or shrinkage towards the origin. While this effect can be achieved in least squares regression with norm regularization, as we know, DRO helps guiding the solution more generally as well, like to kind of have solutions get, have this effect in much greater generality, not necessarily restricted to problems where norm regularization is good. So we saw in the panels in the previous example that DRO solutions get biased in the direction of solutions with smaller perturbations to uh, smaller sensitivity to perturbations. While this is indeed the intended effect, for large scale use, it is better to have a more thorough understanding of the extent of the bias. As is common in statistics and stochastic programming, one can deduce these from large sample properties given by central limit theorem for DRO estimator. Classical normality result without any DRO is given by Huber for general M estimation problems and by Shapiro for stochastic programming problems involving constraints. Assuming unique true optimum theta star, they show that the empirical risk minimizing solution can be seen as a 
Gaussian perturbation around the true optimum tetra star with the magnitude of the perturbation decreasing at the optimal square root end rate. Does this optimal rate happen with DRO as well? Otherwise, it indicates that we are doing something potentially suboptimal, at least from the moderate and large sample perspective. To answer this question, we study two quantities, one of which is the DRO solution, and, and the other is the lambda delta, like which is the compatible uncertainty set, which we introduced earlier, which just is the collection of all optimal decisions when we uh, consider solutions within the Wasserstein model. We study three scenarios with respect to the rate at which the radius of the ball is shrunk as we collect more and more samples. The first case is labeled as shrink fast, where the radius is shrunk faster than the benchmark one over n rate we have identified from the earlier projection theory. In this case, we see that the DRO solution is within a vanishingly small neighborhood of the empirical risk minimizing solution, and it is in some sense diverged from the reality of theta star, the true optimum. It is just diverse as it's just diverse as much as the ERM solutions, the empirical risk minimizing solutions. Likewise, the compatible uncertainty uh, decision uncertainty is vanishingly smaller than the one over square root n that is necessary to cover the theta star. So in that sense, there is no perceptible improvement on empirical risk minimization when you shrink too fast. Moving to the second case of shrinking much lower than the benchmark rate we identified, we see that the DRO solution experiences a push or bias towards solutions with lower sensitivity, as discussed earlier. But the magnitude of the push is so large that the DRO solution and the true optimum are separated by much more than the one over square root and distance which means that the DRO solution is nowhere in the expected vicinity of the true optimum. Likewise, the compatible uncertainty set is much wider than the one over square root n that is necessary to cover theta star and what we would expect of it to qualify as an optimal confidence region. Moving to the third case of shrinking at the benchmark one over n rate we identified from the projection theory, we see that the DRO solution experiences a similar push towards solutions with lower sensitivity, which is captured by this bias term, but only of the right magnitude so that it still stays within the expected vicinity of the true optimum theta star. Based on the radius we choose, the confidence region can be large enough to include all three, the true optimum theta star, the DRO optimum, as well as the empirical risk minimizing solution, all lie within a one over square root and neighborhood, which is captured by this compatible confidence region. In fact, the same radius we arrived at with optimal projection turns out to be the smallest radius guaranteeing the membership of theta star within the compatible uncertainty set. For this reason, we can address the shaded lambda delta as compatible confidence region. In the linear regression, regression example, we can, we can work it out to be a simple ellipsoid. And in settings where there is no closed form ellipsoid of this type, one can actually approximate the confidence region in terms of the supporting hyperplanes in a data-driven estimable way. In the interest of time, we, don't, we do not enter into the details here, but the tutorial uh, paper gives step-by-step -step recipe for constructing the, uh, quantifying the decision uncertainty if one is interested. While the discussed results until now deal with large sample properties, we also have performance bounds in the literature capturing the performance of DRO in the absence of, in the, sorry, in the presence of finite samples. The value in these non-asymptotic bounds lies in that they give a clear upper bound on the error in terms of the dimensions and various distributional problem parameters involved in the problem. Non-asymptotic bounds typically assume Lipschitz losses over compact sets and might require lighter than exponential or Gaussian tails for the data generated distribution. For example, the display result considers Lipschitz losses in classification and regression problems and light-tailed uh, light random variable X and establish that, establishes that when the radius delta and sample size n are sufficiently large, the true risk at any, any decision point is smaller than the worst case risk evaluated at that decision point with high probability. So this provides a uniform bound on loss at all places. 
comparably the, if, if we like to compare the previous asymptotic results they cared only whether we are care, whether we are covering the theta star within the decision uncertainty set so these are results of starkly different nature and uh, we also have various uh, various uh, different uh, finite sample guarantees motivated by different settings and different assumptions and we kind of indicate a few of them here for audience further uh, interest and pursuit if, yeah if interested while it is reassuring to have a clear upper bound on the error in terms of the dimensions and problem parameters, these bounds are not usable, suitable for use in data-driven applications, such as, for example, if you want to kind of like uh, use this for the for choosing delta. Uh, we, we see that the delta can depend on many large constants and many problem parameters, which are not easily estimable from data. In that sense, we cannot use these bounds for selecting the radius or for computing confidence regions, like the applications that we kind of in, uh, illustrated until now. Before concluding, I would like to point that DRO has been a very active research area in the past decade, and there are many complementary ways of dis instilling distributional uncertainty in, the, in, in an optimization problem. Considering distribution specified by moment constraints, are marginal distribution constraints are suitable for a number of problems. From a data-driven perspective, the practice of considering uh, ambiguity balls introduced by phi divergence or Wasserstein distances have gained much attention in the recent years. We have tried to provide a list of useful, but certainly not a comprehensive list of references here, which the readers can pass and explore further and explore references therein if interested. We would like to remark that optimal transport has been used a lot, like in terms of washer chain distances and as well as optimal transport distances, it has been used a lot. Its use has been investigated a lot in distributional robust optimization in the past few years. But the use of optimal transport actually goes beyond uh, beyond of, uh, beyond distributional robust optimization as well. Uh, uh, though, like it's not within the scope of the tutorial to cover them, we would just like to point that they have been used. Optimal transport has been used in uh, applications involving domain adaptation or uh, or in training against adversarial attacks, or in Wasserstein GANs, or in deconvolution and denoising problems, and there is also like the use of Wasserstein uh, distances is also gaining uh, attention in like uh, robust satisfying type of problems for, uh, for optimization formulations. And various various uh, variants of Wasserstein distances have emerged in the recent years too. You can think about like sliced Wasserstein distance or unbalanced optimal transport. Subspace robust uh, washer chain distance, tree slice washer chain distance, smooth washer chain distance, etc. So, we, covering them is not within the scope of the tutorial, but some of the tools here, uh, the tools for like compa uh, for uh, via the projection, uh, projection analysis for combating the uh, dependence on the curse of dimensionality can be used in some of these uh, with some of these variants of uh, washer chain distances as well. With this, I would like to conclude uh, by saying that Washington DRO has gained a significant uh, uh, attention, in, uh, has gained significant attention in recent years. And uh, a key ingredient is the use, is the specification of uncertainty choice or the radius of the Washington ball. Selecting the radius via projection analysis in Washington geometry is what we covered, is what, what, what was what was the main focus of the tutorial. And we discussed the associated statistical properties. The method is the, the, the prescription that we, that, that we gave is an easy to implement method with precise coverage guarantees, and it is good in beating the curse of dimensionality. And what is reassuring is that it matches with the prescriptions, independently obtained prescriptions in high dimensional statistics, which points to the efficacy of uh, in potentially a broader variety of uh, high dimensional problems. The projection analysis is generally applicable beyond the use in DRO as well, as showed by Jose, like uh, one can use it for no novel hypothesis testing uh, tasks such as fairness testing. Also, like one could like, kind of consider other Wasserstein and optimal transport cost variants. So with this, I would like to conclude the talk. It is a privilege to present this uh, tutorial to the wider audience, and we would like to thank the tutorial or organizers for this opportunity. And uh, we look forward to kind of uh, uh, hearing your feedback and then answering your questions. Thank you.